Welcome to our weekly roundup of the hottest trends and stories making waves across the internet. Whether you're a seasoned web surfer or just dipping your toes into the digital realm, we've got you covered. Get ready to dive into a whirlwind of captivating, amusing, and jaw-dropping narratives that might have slipped under your radar. If you're craving entertainment, satisfaction, and mind-bending tales, you've come to the right place. Make sure to smash that like button and hit subscribe so you never miss out on the latest scoop from the world of strangers. Don't forget to drop a comment with the timestamps of your favorite stories. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Without further ado, let the weekly compilation commence. What's the most awkward moment you've ever had? Story 1. I was living with a friend for a while, and during this time there were many awkward moments, the most of which follows. We were sitting down, smoking herb, and playing video games. We were having a pretty good time. We were laughing and joking and stuff, and the day had gone pretty well so far. Throughout this period, the phone would periodically ring, and my friend would return looking ticked off after each call. The phone rang maybe about 20 or so times over a two-hour period. Clearly, someone was being a butthole. Another hour goes by with just as many calls, and eventually his mom returns home from work a few hours earlier than she normally would have. A little while later, a car pulled up out front and someone was laying on the horn. It's the butthole. It was my buddy's father, who was unmatched in douchebaggery and being a peanhead. He gets out of the car, slams the door behind him, hops the fence, avoiding the gate altogether, bolts up the front steps, and proceeds to pound on the door like a jerkwad. But he goes to answer the door, and they both enter nonchalantly. They leave the living room and enter the kitchen and have what seemed like a pretty civil discussion. Ten minutes go by, and during this time I'm shooting stuff in Halo. Buddy re-enters the living room, followed by his father, who has the look of a clinically constipated man. But he sits down and picks up his controller and begins to help me shoot stuff. Not even a second later, his father screams, What the frick are you doing, you fat frick? Why don't you go out for a walk? My buddy tells him to go be intimate with himself and to leave. Awkwardness sets in. I keep my eyes on the screen, and his dad quietly stands there glaring at us both for at least a couple of minutes. More awkward. Why don't you get a freaking job, huh? I have a job, Dad. Well, why the frick aren't you working? Today's my day off, peanhead. Curse you. Don't talk to me like that. I'm your freaking father. You should respect me, fat jerk. Dad, you're a butthole. You treat me, mom, and sister like filth. You don't talk to me or sister at all. You left mom because you're an alcoholic substance user, and you're the one without a job. So why don't you leave? Blah, blah, blah. Dialogue continues, all while me and my buddy are tearing through hordes of enemies. My friend doesn't miss a beat, but eventually he does lose his temper. He begins screaming, and now there's a shouting match going on with me sitting there. Maximum awkward achieved. I had no idea what to do, so I quietly set the controller down and inched my way out of the room. Too long didn't read? Buddy and his father had a screaming match no more than ten feet away from me. As far as I know, Buddy made Dad his shrew. Man win for him. Were the emotions just that high that they felt they had to have this discussion with this other person in the room? Did they acknowledge him at all? I want to know if they had a conversation afterwards about it. I wonder if the guy just avoided hanging out with this person for a while. Was the dad hoping to shame this guy in front of his friend? Story 2. I was dating a girl in high school once who had a really messed up family. Total rednecks. Her mom had to have weighed more than 300 pounds, was rude, an enormous slob. She always had food stains on her clothes and pretty ignorant. Her dad was pretty much the same, only in better shape, obviously bitter and constantly in a bad mood. My girlfriend, let's call her Samantha, hinted at the fact that he was emotionally and physically abusive after we broke up. She was pretty hot, by the way, and smart, too. GT program, honors classes, a real package, but for the family. Many years after we dated, I know she actually took her parents to court and got emancipated. Physical shaming was involved, so yeah, bad situation. Anyway, we didn't ever hang out at her house. Always my parents' house, school, or someplace around town with her or my friends. I don't know the reason at the time, so one day I decided to surprise her, bought some roses, and came over to her place with the flowers. 
Her mom answers the door and is all suspicious. When I asked for Samantha, she starts screaming at the top of her lungs for her husband. Samantha's dad came out, looks at me, looks at the flowers, and starts flying off the handle. I'm stuck outside, dumbfounded and bewildered, as he storms around the house. I can hear him rummaging around, throwing stuff, shouting, Where is it? And then finally, I hear a kind of triumphant, Aha! Next thing I know, I can hear Samantha's voice saying, No, Daddy, please! Over and over again, and her fat slob of a mom is staring at me with a smug smile. Next thing I can hear is a dog yelping, a screen door being tossed open, and then, bang, a gunshot. Samantha starts crying, and the dog has gone silent. The mom slams the door, and I hear yelling on the inside of the house. I'm still confused, until the door opens, and it's the father screaming, Get the frick off our yard! So, yeah, I do what he says. I found out later, when Samantha broke up with me, that her dad had told her if she ever brought a boy to the house, he was going to unalive her dog. And he did. That's why we never hung out at her house. She had never told me because she didn't want me to know how messed up her home life was. Too long didn't read? Girlfriend's dad shot her dog because she was dating someone. Poor everyone around this situation. This guy was just wanting to surprise this girl. Must have felt really guilty for being the cause of the dog's death, although not intentionally. There should have been some communication at this point. I'm pretty sure she started planning her emancipation on day one. I wonder if their breaking up had anything to do with this situation. Story 3 Oh God, I can be an extremely awkward person at times. Here is one of my worst what-the-hell-was-I-thinking moments. I had plans to hang out with my friend Dom. We had been hallway friends for the majority of high school, but only recently had started hanging out. Keep in mind, I'm extremely shy and awkward when I first start getting to know someone, and since we had only recently begun to hang out, I was still in the awkward phase. He had an appointment, at the time I didn't know what for, which is a very important detail, set for after school, so I told him I could just pick him up somewhere in town after he was done. We decide on Safeway, which is a pretty central location. I pull into the Safeway parking lot, and I see him walk up to the car. He's all smiles. I'm not really sure what the occasion is, but it's always nice to see someone happy. I unlock the door and let him in. The first thing he does is flash a huge grin, moves his face in super close and asks, Notice anything? Little awkward old me has no idea what he's talking about, and frantically searches for anything noticeable. Since he's smiling so big, my eyes are naturally drawn to his teeth, which were in some need of brushing. Never in my entire life will I ever understand why I did this, but I gave out a little half laugh and say, <laughs> nothing a little brushing won't fix. His smile dropped. I just got my braces off. Oh, I done messed up. He looked like he just got beat over the head with a sack of unalive puppies. I saw the words leaving my lips as joy-seeking missiles, and each one scored a direct hit. We drove in silence to his house, continued to hang out afterwards, but never spoke of that situation again. Again, it comes down to communication. Maybe this person should have asked what the appointment was for. Maybe the dude should have volunteered what he was there for. I could understand if these were the type of braces that were behind the teeth. I might not understand if they were the regular braces that would be seen over the teeth. Story 4. I'm currently dating a Pakistani girl. I was over at her house watching a movie and I jokingly said that she owed me $20. She did. Normally I wouldn't care, but I needed gas money. This escalated and we had a little argument and were just silent for a while, which is normal for us when we have an argument. We just shut up and let it pass. So five minutes later or so, her parents and aunt come downstairs to watch the movie with us. This is where it starts to get awkward. They notice we aren't speaking to each other, and her father starts speaking to her in Urdu. She sort of just brushes him off in English. Not now, Dad. He says something again, then her mom says something, then her aunt says something. My girlfriend again basically just says, not now, in English. Mind you, it's not uncommon for them to speak Urdu around me. It's their first language, after all. So they keep talking in Urdu, gesturing at me. My girlfriend is becoming more and more visibly upset. 
I have no idea what is happening at this point. Eventually, she just goes to her room. I'm left sitting there while her mom and aunt watch the movie in chat in Urdu. The aunt's English isn't very good, and her father glances between me and the movie. I excuse myself to go to the bathroom and then go talk to my girlfriend. Her family was asking what happened, but she just wanted a little privacy. I seriously had no idea what was happening. Too long didn't read? My girlfriend's Pakistani family was arguing about me in Urdu while I was sitting next to them. I had no idea what was happening. People say it's rude to speak a foreign language in front of those who don't speak it. While I agree, this has never been an issue before, and hasn't since then. These people have treated me like a son since I started dating their daughter. They're kind people. Story 5 I used to babysit a three-year-old when I was in high school. It was her birthday and her dad invited me. I bought her a stuffed snakes and she was into snakes and some helium balloons and showed up a few minutes early in case the parents needed some free babysitting while they set up. I get there and nobody is there except the mom and the three-year-old, so I play with her and supervise while the mom ignores I exist, which is cool, she scares me anyways. About an hour goes by. Things are getting a bit awkward. Nobody is showing up. I'm in their house being in the way, but leaving now would be rude, so I wait around. Finally, kids and family show up. The kids are upstairs, all the adults are sitting around the living room, and nobody acknowledges I'm there. I smile and try to say hi, but people just look away. So I stand in a corner by the stairs waiting to be thanked so I can leave. And about another hour goes by, me just standing right there in the corner of the room, about five feet away from everyone, awkward as hell. The dad shows up, and he stands right next to me, staring into space, sipping a beer. I try to chat with him, but he just nods and stares off into space, ignored by the rest of the people as well. Finally, I'm thinking, curse this, and I announce I have to go. Everyone just stares for a second, then turns away. So I just walk out of the house. No thank you, no bye, no hello, no offer of food or drink, no offer to sit down. You were unalive the whole time. Only explanation. Story 1. Much like a code among smokers, you can ask anyone smoking to bum one, there are no barriers among complete strangers if she likes your dress, glasses, haircut, etc. You receive the compliment with delight and immediately give details as to how to acquire the same. Then, you move on again like the total strangers that you are. I had a woman just ask me once how I wash my hair. I have curly hair, so it's a big thing to know your routine. And I spend 10 minutes speaking to a complete stranger on the streets of D.C. like she was my BFF about co-washing, hair twisting, hair products, and all that jazz. One caveat to this is that if there is a significant age difference between the compliment giver, being the older one, and the receiver, then there's a chance it might not be received well. It's a fine line. I was at a very serious business convention, suits and all, talking to a vendor who was explaining how her program worked. Lots of big words, most serious. After she finished, I thanked her and wondered if, perhaps, she could let me know how she got her curls so perfect and full. Mine were so flat in comparison. It was like a light switch. This serious government programmer turned into my 13-year-old squealing bestie as she told me her step-by-step -step hair care and gave me pointers. To this day, I still use her advice and my curls are banging. Thank you, random business convention lady. That one did not occur to me until I just read it out loud. I've seen this kind of thing being used in TV shows and the like, but I've also remembered seeing it a few times in real life. I think I've had a couple of instances where I've complimented a guy's suit. They gave a polite thank you, not too enthusiastic, but that's about it. If I wanted to know about where it was from, I'd have to ask more questions myself. This part of the girl code is pretty cool. Story 2 this one especially applies to college girls. If you're at a party and you see a girl doing something she might regret the next day due to drinking way too much, you go over there and make sure she's okay. And watch the drinks if you can. Make sure nothing gets accidentally slipped in them. Holy hell, you just reminded me of a time in college. I was drinking at a frat house party and they had a pre-made punch with vodka. I drank at least four of them and don't remember anything else. I woke up the next morning in a dorm room with a girl sleeping in the other bed and one on the floor that I only barely knew. Turns out the vodka was actually ever clear and one of the frat guys was trying to drag me up to his room when a couple of girls saw me and took me to their room. 
really grateful for them. I got roofied at a bar once. The person, whoever it was, thought I was just a girl at the bar alone. Turned my back for a few seconds to look around. I don't remember much past the first drink. Thankfully, I was with a group of army guys, including my husband, who took care of me. If they hadn't been there, I don't think I would have been able to protect myself from a mosquito, let alone some person with ill intent. I'm glad those girls helped you out. I guess according to this one, even bros can appreciate the girl code. A bunch of army guys? Forget about it. You just obtained your own personal military escort. Did the guy ever get any consequences from his actions? I think a husband plus a bunch of army guys can equal a whole lot of consequences dealt. Story 3. Other than the period and hair tie things that have already been mentioned, and these are more largely dependent on knowing the other girl or woman's interests, you recognize who she's interested in and make sure to disappear unobtrusively to give them alone time. Don't post pictures or show them around in which you and only you look good, even if you look like a caveman in every other photo of both of you. If she's considering buying something, be it clothes, a haircut, or whatever, give her honest but not mean advice. If she ignores you, shut up and never mention it again. If she's already bought it, especially if it was expensive, don't say anything unless she asks. And be sure she actually wants an honest opinion, not a confirmation that she looks good. There's a difference. How do you know if they want an opinion or just confirmation? It heavily depends on context. If you're all dressed up to go somewhere and she spins around and smiles into the mirror and says, How do I look? It's pretty obvious, not in I would like your opinion. If she specifically asks for an honest opinion, or if she's comparing wardrobe items, or deciding whether to donate clothing, that's probably a time for a more honest opinion. If she mentions the word fat, cut your losses and run. Yeah, as a mature man, I will translate for my 20-something bros. Say she looks great regardless. Ah, yes. The eternal question that can never be answered. At least when guys are asked of this by their girlfriends. That's one area you have to pay attention. Story 4. If she's dating a known abuser, take turns getting her out of the house. Play cards, shop for shoes, ask her to help you lay out the garden, make pie. Never broach the subject yourself. Just make sure she knows she's welcome any time, day or night, with or without advance notice. I've been going through this with a friend, and I've learned that always focusing on the good, her value, her skills, loving on her, and always telling her the truth nicely when they ask for advice about the relationship has helped her a lot as she slowly tries to leave. Also, calling out behavior in a light manner when they're talking about it to reinforce abnormality or problematic behaviors. He totally threw a fit when I tried to wear a miniskirt the other day. <laughs> Men, right? Oh my God, no way would I be okay with that. I don't know how you put up with it. I've never had a boyfriend try to control what I wear. It would drive me crazy. Sometimes they test the waters to see if something that bothered them is normal. And if you laugh it off or brush it off, it only makes it seem okay. Story 5. As a hairstylist, when a man comes in with his girlfriend or wife, I always include her in the conversation, ask if she wants to sit with us, need a drink, etc., and make eye contact when speaking to her. Similarly, when I meet a male friend's girlfriend for the first time, I make sure to be nice, ask questions, and be interested in her. It alleviates the threat factor and shows support for their relationship. Really, this should be done regardless of gender. Just treat your friend's partners with respect and kindness. I have lost a lot of friends this way because I didn't realize that. Now I just think of my friends in terms of a package. If they have a partner, I include them, always. I befriend their partner and try to invite them as well. It's a buy one, get one deal. And then when your friend breaks up with him, you end all contact. Remember who the original friend was and stick with them. I've enjoyed most of my female friend's boyfriends, but when they break up, that's it. I'll say hey if I run into them and catch up, but I never continue the friendship beyond the breakup. Exception. Doesn't count if you met them as a couple. Then there's no loyalty. Just continue friendship with whomever you preferred. <laughs> Story 6. Lipstick on their teeth, eyeliner in the corner of their eye, skirt tucked into pantyhose. You let them know without making a huge deal about it. When I was in college, I was walking uphill to class from my apartment with about a dozen people walking behind me. A girl suddenly appeared and pulled me aside, and before she even opened her mouth, I was like, 
Is my dress tucked into my tights? She nods. I try to laugh it off while untucking my skirt and wishing the earth would open up and swallow me whole, and we continue on our way. The same thing happened again later that same day. Ugh. Don't know if it's any consolation, but there was one day I was caught with my fly open. Seven times in a single day. It wasn't until I got home that I finally realized I wasn't just absentmindedly unzipping my pants. It was broken the whole time. Seven times? In a single day? How many times do you open up your pants in a day, my dude? It was broken the whole time. Ooh. Seven times in a single day. Finally, another soul who enjoys playing with their fly. It was broken the whole time. Ooh. Yeah, guys don't necessarily do this. They won't tell you so they can laugh about it with their friends. They'll just point and you have to discover it for yourself. Only a really close friend will let you know. In that regard, the girl code trumps the bro code. Story 7. You help other women who seem to be in trouble. When I was a teenager, my mom and I went to Walmart to get groceries. We split up to save time and a man started stalking me through the aisles. I finally got out to a main area and saw a lady with two kids. Walked right up to her and stood as close as possible. She was confused, but when I made a motion at the guy, she understood. She loudly thanked me for getting the milk and called me honey. Also referred to her son as my brother. Once the guy left, she stayed with me until I saw my mom, and then stayed where she was until I got to my mom and motioned that I was okay. That lady deserves an award for helping me that day. I'll always remember this video from when I was a kid that said if you're separated from your parents somewhere in public to look for a grandma or mother with children. That's what I've taught my spawn. Look for a mom or dad with kids, because they will stop and help you out, even if it's finding the right trusted adult to take over. Kids can't tell uniforms apart. Story 8. Letting someone know about a makeup meltdown. I love makeup. I work in a nursing home. Thermostats are always freaking set to 80 in the rooms. Not ideal for keeping that makeup looking fresh. Sometimes my eyeliner will transfer to my upper lid. Mascara will flake off, sweat stripes through my foundation, etc. I get so ticked when I don't have time to go to the bathroom for three hours, thus not available to check myself out in the mirror and find out something on my face is all jacked up. I always discreetly tell someone if something is off because that's your face. That's where people are looking. Same goes for hair malfunctions. Like if a girl has a smooth ponytail, but I can see a random loop of hair sticking out. Maybe it got caught on a ring or earring or something. Always say something. Gotta help her sister out, you know. Get some Urban Decay setting spray. Effing amazing and worth the price. Story 9. Upon meeting a woman in any situation, you typically compliment something they're wearing. Options can include jewelry, shoes, purses, clothing, accessories, hairstyles, makeup, etc. They will then compliment you back. That's how it works. I hate this bit of girl code and am terrible at it. I love fashion and makeup and I always try to look my best. I also notice and appreciate the efforts of others, but the verbal exchange of appearance-based compliments itself feels so forced and uncomfortable to me. They don't even really feel like compliments because at this point, socially, it's sort of an obligation, and often it implies a glaring lack of anything else to say that's more worthwhile. So when I get a compliment from another woman on something I'm wearing, I am terrible at returning the favor convincingly. Even if I 100% mean it, it always comes off as cheap, cringy flattery to my own ears. Gosh, that turned into quite a rant, but seriously... I guess even though the code requires it, some people still struggle with it. At least this person is attempting to return the favor. Someone complimented them, they want to compliment something back. She says she appreciates fashion and can appreciate when someone looks good. I hope she can find a way to make those compliments seem natural and not forced. Story 1. If you're planning to have roommates... You need to discuss and come to an arrangement on things like acceptable cleanliness, boundaries with things like food or other things you've purchased, chores, and general expectations for your living space. Living with friends can be fun, but if you're not on the same page before living, it can be awful and lead to destroyed friendships. I was one of the first to move out at 18, and so many friends and roommates will take advantage of you if you don't figure this out up front. Things like... Why should I take out the trash or clean? 
I don't mind a pile of trash bags or a sink full of crusty, disgusting dishes. This is just an example of a real argument I had with a roommate. Food is another big one. I tend to like sharing food with people, but some people will not contribute the same quality, or will not contribute at all. I think another thing that you need to worry about is kitchen times. I've had roommates where we've all had to try and cook at the same time. It didn't really work out. Especially when one person is just cooking up some very greasy, very hot hamburgers and just getting oil all over the place. It might help to kind of stagger when everybody gets access. Especially when the kitchen is probably not going to accommodate the amount of roommates that are there at the same time. Story 2. It's easier to clean once a week than wait until your place visibly needs cleaning or tidying. It should take no more than 30 minutes to wipe things down, throw out the old stuff in the fridge, etc. Wait until things get crusty and you'll be scrubbing for hours. Same goes for laundry. If there's a washer or dryer in your new place or on the property, pick a day and do it every week. Waiting until you have no clean underwear is a rookie mistake. Also, it usually makes more sense to wash your dishes by hand immediately after use than wait until they fill a dishwasher. Or worse, Stack everything in the sink until they become gross. Cleaning one just-used plate and fork takes less than a minute, whereas having no clean dishes when you're hungry sucks. I learned all of these things from my mother, broke every rule when I moved out, and discovered the hard way that she was right. I completely agree with cleaning once a week. One, for someone like me, it is a form of habit that I can follow. And two, it's very true. Cleaning once a week takes less time. You're not dealing with big, heavy, crusty, disgusting messes. It's just a quick tidying up. Story 3. If you're moving in with roommates, you will have conflict. There will be issues about noise. There will be issues about cleanliness. There will be issues about food, about money. You name it. If you're going to go live with people, ask about all of these things. If it's eh, meh, or we each do our own cleaning or some stupid stuff. I'm telling you, you're going to hate yourself at some point and wonder how you got in this mess. That 3 a.m. on a Tuesday late night smash session from your roommate next door that you can hear like it's in the same room. That 23 boxes of pizza and four cases of empty beer bottles lying around two weeks after a party. That blasting music or TV all day every day. Some people are jerkwads. Don't leave it up to chance. Choose your roommates wisely and learn to set boundaries. Seriously, it's no different than living with a significant other. It would be hard to be picky for roommates in this day and age when rent is at an all-time high. It would be tempting, but don't fall for it. If the rent on the place is really low, you should be asking the most questions about the roommates. It's like a job interview. This is the place you're going to after work. Is this a person or persons you're going to be able to deal with? Story 4. Landlords are parasites and will take any and every opportunity to mess you over. Never, under any circumstance, trust a parasite. Have every single interaction with them in writing. If they call, tell them to send you an email and hang up. Read up on your local laws and know not only their obligations, but your own because they will try to make you do something that isn't your responsibility and or refuse to do something that's theirs. Take photos or a video of literally everything, every surface, every carpet, every window, every corner, everything, because they will try to blame you for something and keep your deposit or charge you for some made-up hogwash. If you're dealing with an estate agent or some sort of middleman to rent a place, Remember that they're salesmen and not your friend, so they will lie to you to make you sign a tenancy. A lab. Story 5. If you live with roommates, beware when they offer food. I had roommates once that always made more food than they could eat and would throw away any leftovers because they didn't like to eat leftovers. They told me I could take the leftovers for lunch at work. All was well until they stopped paying their share of the utilities. It wouldn't be so bad if not for the fact they would leave the lights on all night long while they slept, which ran up my electricity bill. When I confronted them, they told me they shouldn't have to pay utilities because I ate their food. 
food, which they said they'd throw out anyway. If they had mentioned those strings, I'd never have accepted their generosity. Also, never get into an argument with a roommate when they've clearly gone through half a bottle of whiskey. It won't end well. Story 6. My husband and I were spending too much on eating out every month. It was in our budget, but we'd end up going over. This month, we decided not to put it in our budget and not go out at all, but raise our grocery budget a little. It has been so nice. I'm pregnant, and when I have a craving, I have a hard time concentrating on other stuff and a hard time eating food that's not that craving. I was really wanting Panda, but we couldn't go out for it, so I went and bought all the stuff and made egg rolls and fried rice, the Panda recipe, at home. It was so good, and it was something I've never done before, so it was a cool experience. Point is, learning to cook new things can really save you money from eating out. Because honestly, my fried rice was better than pandas. Oh yes, this is a big one. Learn to cook. Uber Eats is not your friend. DoorDash is not your friend. Don't get me wrong, they're not bad in a pinch. But they're not something you should rely on. You can go to any bookstore. Heck, any used bookstore. And there are about 12 million cookbooks out there. Heck, go to the library. Spend a day. Read up. I think there's even recipes on this thing called the, uh, what is it? The internet. That's right. Story 7. Learn what you can buy from a dollar store, what you can buy generic brands of, and what you need to buy name brands of. For example, I wouldn't buy Ziploc bags at the dollar store. You get like eight to a box when you could spend the extra two dollars on a 100 pack. But I would buy the generic brand from a grocery store. Except if I was buying the freezer bags, then I prefer the name brand. Same with things like cream cheese. Get the name brand. Condiments. Get the name brand. Cleaning products. Dollar store, etc. You'll find out where you prefer to buy certain things from. But also, don't cheap out on things like toilet paper or the things you really like. If you love your brand name potato chips, don't get the generic kind. If you like pickles, splurge and buy the big jar. After a few grocery trips, you'll know what you like to have around and what you can sacrifice. Story 8. All the bills you're responsible for and how much your grocery shop will cost. In the UK, there's rent, council tax, TV license, gas, electric, internet connection, entertainment, Netflix, etc. if you use them, travel costs if you take the bus or train, car upkeep, payments and fuel if you drive, Contents insurance, car insurance, mobile phone contract, pay-as-you-go costs, and your grocery costs. Then, once all your living costs are considered, then there's any other bills you may have. Example, credit card bills. Anything left over, you have to consider furniture, if you don't have any, clothing, shoes, gifts for family or friends, birthdays or Christmas, Keeping money saved for emergencies, example, car repairs or replacing an expensive electrical item, and or any holidays you'd like to go on. And then finally, whatever is left for your own enjoyment. Story 9. Definitely learn to cook. It's much cheaper eating home-cooked meals, but way less enjoyable unless you know how to throw a few decent dishes together. If you're renting from a private landlord and are responsible for utilities, Try to get information on average utility bills. I once rented a super uninsulated apartment with electric heat, and my energy bill peaked at $600 for a single month one winter. That hurt. Before you even move out, keep an eye out for deals on pots or pans and other durable items that you need on Facebook Marketplace and other secondhand sites. Be extremely careful with any soft furniture or rugs that you buy on the cheap or possibly avoid it altogether and go new. A bed bug infestation is no fun. Also, don't overlook thrift stores. Where I'm at right now, there are a lot of thrift stores. You can find deals on a lot of stuff, including dishes and pots and pans. You can look them over right there to see if they're clean enough. You can also get some good deals on some cheap rice cookers or slow cookers, even furniture. If you're the type that worries that someone's going to give you grief because you bought half of your stuff at a secondhand store, just don't tell them, and then reconsider your friendships. 
It sounds like that friendship would cost you a lot more than you can afford anyway. Story 10. Take pics of the apartment before moving your stuff in. The carpet, the floors, baseboards, everything, just to cover your butt. Some landlords are total pieces of work and will try to keep security for a stain in the rug that was there when you moved in. Happened to me once. I moved out of a place and they tried to claim my deposit by saying they needed to thoroughly clean the house after I moved out of it. The contract said it needed to be left in the same condition as when I moved in. I sent them photos of the day I moved in, showing amongst other things the mold on the walls, the dirty oven, and the previous tenant's toenail clippings on the bedroom floor. Technically, I did not leave toenail clippings behind, so it wasn't in the exact same condition. Story 11. Live cheap until you have a financial backup plan and cash to back it up. Stuff happens, and you might need to haul whole lot of a bad place ASAP. What are your local renter laws? Who can you call to help you move? Do you have rent and bill payments for a month or two if you lose your job? Basically, have a oh-snap-and-run plan for your living place. Second, fire up your maps program and see what's around your neighborhood. Nice way to find local businesses not on main streets or public hangout places like parks and walking trails. Finally, the library is your friend. Free internet, free books, and cheap movie or game rentals. Scanning and printing services. Great for free entertainment and self-betterment when everything else is too expensive. What's the most pathetic thing someone did for attention? Story 1. There was this girl in my high school freshman year who was in general classes with me. I was meant to be in academics class for the kids who learned at a faster rate. I became friends with her because I felt like she needed a friend. Around my sophomore year, I moved to a smarter class and she was always making me feel bad for leaving my old friend group for a new friend group. There were times where she would text me that she was gonna unalive herself and I was like, don't do that stuff. She did this often and I was very concerned. I told my counselor at school. Around the end of junior year, she texted me saying she fell and hit her head, now she's in the hospital. Then apparently her brother texts through her phone saying she's in critical condition. Then her mom texted on her phone saying, She's expired! She's flatlined! I was just texting all sarcastic like, Oh no, not on alive, she can't be. Ended up blocking her and never talked to her again. She was missing days of school to make it seem like she was legit gone. She was alive, she was just seeking attention. As of December 2022, she's still alive. There was this kid in my high school who was mentally ill. Like we knew something was wrong. He tried to hurt himself with a pencil in front of me because I told him I didn't want to hang out with him anymore. He really liked this girl in my homeroom who had really big breasts. Seemed fake, but she told us she had something that made them abnormally big. Like anime girl breasts. She was a cool girl and also liked anime. This guy only liked her because her breasts were huge. He asked her out. She denied him. What was his response? Jump off the stairs and cry. He broke his arm and made the whole situation about him. I was quite surprised and embarrassed that he did all that. I'm trying to think back of when I was that young. Feelings are just starting to become a new thing for us. We're experiencing things we probably never experienced before. Because of that, they become more intense. A rejection feels like the most heart-wrenching thing ever, just because we've never experienced it before. It's even worse when we have these feelings and we can't talk them out with someone else, especially someone who's more of a social outcast. And then that just perpetuates those feelings and a vicious cycle emerges. Story 2 I think it was my junior year of high school in the mid-2010s. Spanish class. There was this one kid, let's call him Kevin, a freshman in my class. At my school, freshmen and juniors and sophomores and seniors would often have the same classes together, who came in a bad mood and proceeded to sit in front of the projector while the teacher was teaching. The teacher sent him to the office, or guidance counselor, and when Kevin came back, our teacher sat him down next to me, and I had to babysit him for the rest of the class, walking him through the assignments that day. I would feel bad for him, except the rest of the year, 
he proved himself to be the most annoying, distracting little jerk I've ever met, and for some ungodly reason, I was always sat in the same group of desks with him. He admitted to me about playing gambling games with real money on his phone during class. With the volume up, the teacher would come up to him and tell him to stop. Kevin would deny having his phone out and I'd say, Yes, you did. Stop lying to her face. Yes, I said that. Sometime later, Kevin and two other classmates, who I also wasn't too fond of, came to talk to me during lunch trying to be friendly, and the interaction ended when he decided to shove his butt into my face, asking if there was a stain on his pants. I think he thought this was funny because he was an immature freshman, but I was so ticked off that when I saw him casually talking to the dean later, I stormed up and told him what he had done. I managed to pretend to be calm and cool when we were in the office, so much so the dean praised me for being so mature, but Kevin got into some serious trouble, never spoke to me again, and I'm very grateful for that. Some people just aren't ready to take the next step in their social evolution. It also reminds me of the saying, insanity is doing the same thing over and over, accepting a different result. I guess Kevin just felt like he didn't find the right amateur joke yet. Maybe that's why this person was always sat with Kevin. They were hoping some of their maturity would rub off on Kevin. Apparently, no. Story 3. Backstory. I was a camp counselor at a local rec for the summer, and there was this one girl who was the typical attention hog, dyed hair type. She was a co-camp counselor who was two years younger than me. She made up stories about how her uncle was in the mafia and other stuff. My other fellow counselors got up to the point where we questioned all of her stories. She even pretended to be gay for a while. This girl, let's call her Tegan, kept fainting every time me and her were alone in the break room. I don't know if she liked me or what, but it happened many times. I could see her eyes fluttering and everything, but for the first few times she did this, I believed it. Then I realized it was fake after I said I'll grab the head counselor and she miraculously woke up. She told us she had all these injuries on her legs but could walk or run faster than anybody else despite this. I was obviously ticked because I actually have something wrong with my legs, but she would brush over me and try to one-up my real injuries. She said she even got forced into intercourse at school by some guy but most of us didn't believe her because someone from her school came to the Rex pool and told us that she made it up after the guy rejected her and got in huge trouble. Many other stories I could tell, but I tried to keep my distance once I saw through the smoke. She tried to get me in trouble after I avoided her by spreading many rumors. So many stories I could tell. Last one, though, she kept saying how she was self-unaliving, but would mention it every time she could. And as someone who has tried to commit self-unaliving, I was not only ticked, but also could obviously see how she was trying to gain sympathy because of the way she acted about it. There's a literary concept called the Mary Sue. It usually describes not very good writing. It's typically a character who is kind of basically just like the author who tries to insert themselves into the story and they are just perfect with no flaws. Any story they tell is charismatic. Every person falls in love with them. It sounds like this person was trying to be a real-life Mary Sue. Did anyone actually believe her when she tried to spread rumors about the person? Story 4. Had a diva at work at a past job four years ago intentionally bump into me multiple times to get my attention. Objectively, she was the prettiest girl out of the 100 or so women that worked at the distribution center. All of the men from young to middle age, from lowest positions to middle management, lost their minds over her. I was mad at her since I was the one sent the most often to pick up her slack. I was practically doing her work for her. She showed everyone a condescending attitude. All of the ground floor management gave her complete free reign. You had to see it to believe me. It was hard to hide my slightly annoyed frown every time she was nearby. On the first day ever seeing her, I already noticed her massive ego seeing her interactions with other people, along with her body language and her getting her way. 
It was a bit odd when she seemed shocked I nonchalantly turned forward to the security checkout for the facility. I only looked back if anyone I knew was exiting as well. We were the only ones there besides security. They told me to give them a minute. Next couple seconds, she bumped into me as if she didn't see me. I was a bit more annoyed at her since I for sure made eye contact, but I calmly brushed it off. She apologized. She did that a couple of more times over the span of two weeks at the security checkout. I got moved into twilight shift and didn't see her at all after that. I only worked that job a couple of months more when I switched to another different job. Story 5. This one's easy. And like most people, I've seen a goodly share of childish behavior in the wild. We went to a meetup of fans of a small niche band at a public park. This girl, and I mean 20-something, Kim, was there with her fiancé. Seemed nice enough, but kept name-dropping that she knew the band. She did, in fact, but she was way too pleased about it. You could tell it was really part of her identity, at the moment at least. So when we had a trivia game and she got one wrong, she lost it, howled, rolled on the ground, wailed, doesn't anyone care? Until her fiancé managed to calm her down. There's a definite tension among the previously friendly group now. Things settled down, we even are relaxed enough to eat and joke around, and Kim's fiancé, an apple girl herself, laughs at something and decides to roll backward on the grass, right over Kim's leg. I wonder how much it could hurt, since the fiancé also seemed quite soft, but Kim launched once more into hysterics, howling, rolling, and clutching her legs, screaming, doesn't anyone care? Because, like last time, we're all sitting and looking at each other in confusion. The fiancé is now back on the job, apologizing and the like, but I want to take her aside and ask her if she's really sure she wants to tie herself to this human disaster. The gathering kind of just ended after that as one lady who had brought her daughter said, Oh dear, look at the time. Got to get going, and the rest of us basically, almost as one, leapt to our feet saying much the same. Kim tried to get us to do it again a while later. Yeah, no thanks. Story 6. My ex did an insane amount of things for attention. Biggest one was lying and saying she had been essayed by my other ex, who had actually essayed me for months. She did it for attention and specifically to steal attention away from me about the situation. She faked flashbacks both around people and in bed with me while we'd be cuddling at night, often while I was suppressing my own real ones to deal with her flashbacks, or even just when I was trying to rant about my other ex and the stuff he put me through, not just the essay he did to me. She admitted to me that she lied about this for attention a few days prior to moving in with me. Turns out, she has hysterionic personality disorder, which is characterized by intense attention-seeking behavior that can sometimes be genuinely dangerous, like actually really bad stuff for the sake of attention. Still doesn't justify this, and I broke up with her after she told me because there's no way I could ever trust her again. What made her confess? Did she feel guilty? Did she sense this person wasn't buying her stories and felt like she was going to lose her? That kind of behavior does sound dangerous. What cool thing did you accidentally do? Story 1. My sophomore year in high school, I was on the water polo JV team. During one of our tournaments, we managed to unfortunately be stuck in the last game. It happened to be the day of the homecoming dance and several of the guys on the team had dates. Our town was about an hour away and it was approaching 5 p.m. I was a good, strong swimmer and probably the one with the most long-term endurance. However, my dribbling and shooting were abysmal. The fourth quarter in the last minute or two, we tied up the game. I can't remember if I stole the ball or if someone else did, but I ended up with the ball with only the goalie in front of me. I dribbled the ball down the pool to the goal, but I had a problem. I could only do dry shots where you pull yourself up and launch the ball after pulling your arm back and couldn't do wet shots where you shoot as part of your stroke. Unfortunately, there was a defender at my heels on my shooting side, so with the goal rapidly approaching to the point of no return, 
I did the only thing I could think of doing. I grabbed the ball with my right shooting hand and spun 360 degrees left away from the defender. The defender raced past me but was unable to turn around to properly guard me. While protecting my eyes as much as possible to keep from losing my contacts, the sun shining directly into my eyes, I saw through the splashing water the smallest bit of the net. I launched the ball toward the open space I had briefly seen from the back, as I didn't have to properly square my hips, and scored with seconds left on the game clock. We won and had a very short post-game talk, almost literally, Great shot, Ben. Let's go so you guys can get ready for the dance. My family then went to a restaurant in the same city as the tournament and celebrated my great-grandma's birthday. Was his great-grandma in the audience watching the game? That would have been pretty cool. It sounds like he deserved a little bit of a dessert. Why wasn't he going to the dance? Did he not have a date? Story 2. I was in the army stationed in Korea for my hardship tour. A mandatory deployment you have to take after you finish basic and MOS training. I was a cook, and on my first day at my duty station, I was assigned to cut vegetables until the sergeant decided to give me a permanent placement. Of course, like anywhere else in the world, hazing was a thing, so unbeknownst to me, a tall guy decided to come up behind me and try to scare me. I was the smallest girl in the room. My non-slick shoes weren't non-slick, so my balance was already compromised and I was focusing on not cutting my fingers off while trying to maintain my balance. In short, I was not in the mood to be messed with. When the guy came up behind me, he stuck his fingers in my sides and yelled, scaring me so much I jumped up a little and made this yap sound like a Pomeranian. Everyone else in the kitchen was laughing with the guy until I spun around and bared my teeth at him. When I get upset or frustrated, I clench my teeth, but I had something to say to the butthole, so ergo bearing my teeth. I also have a habit of gesticulating with my hands, with the knife still in one. In the military, you're trained to hold knives point down so you don't accidentally hurt yourself. So here I am, the shortest girl in the kitchen, eyes glaring, teeth bared, gesturing with my knife at his crotch because our height difference put my hand at the perfect placement and growling because I couldn't unclench my jaw. Don't. Do. That. Again. He put his hands up, backed away slowly, and the kitchen was deathly quiet. I didn't notice anything as I turned back to cutting up veggies. Nobody messes with me after that. For being the smallest person in the room, it probably could have gone very bad for her. I could see how in any other time she would have spun around and maybe not had enough fire to sell this, and people would have laughed at her anyway, like how they would laugh at a little dog being vicious. I'm glad to see it worked in her favor. I'm glad she could stand up to someone and be taken seriously. Story 3. The paintballing thing reminded me of my only experience with it. In high school, with all my cousins who were in town for Christmas... And it was a family activity, so I went, despite being the least sporty person in my family, by a lot. By sheer luck, I did pretty well, probably because I had zero sporty clothes, so borrowed my dad's old camo he still had from the army for some reason, which surprisingly worked great to just not getting hit. Also, it was cold, and when I did get hit, the balls were half frozen, and the camo was so thick they'd bounce off not break and splatter, which my cousins decided for that game meant no paint equals no out. So I just didn't mention it hurt like hell so as not to bring the fun down, and it gave the illusion I was untouchable. I wasn't great, but I wasn't bad either. And by the end of the day, I was so jumpy, I was just shooting anything that moved as everyone else was so much faster than me. I was trigger happy. It got down to a final fight against another team of strangers, and I had no idea I was the last one of my cousins still in the game. It went on so long, and it was cold and muddy, and we were all done. I saw an opponent peek over a cover and shot at it. By pure chance, I hit him. Not him exactly, 
but apparently he had been raising his gun to call surrender, and I shot his hand, knocking the gun to the ground and giving us a very questionable win. My cousins freaked and called me ruthless and badass for years after that. Never mentioned that it was a total fluke, though, because it's kind of nice. I had a similar situation in paintball once. I was shot at from someone out of the blue, and the paintball, for some reason, just bounced off me. It wasn't cold or anything. The guy that shot me called for a judgment call. The judge came over and said, You were shot, weren't you? I said, No, take a look, and pointed to where the unbroken ball was. He saw it, judged it as, nope, it didn't hit me. Keep playing. Story 4. I've got two things that happened in the same vacation my family went on this summer. So we were going across the country to see relatives on my dad's side, because pretty much everyone on his side lives over there. And we rented out a small lakeside house from one of my dad's friends for our first week there. One of my uncles came over to visit with us, and we were playing catch with those little water footballs that can get pretty heavy when they absorb a lot of water. Anyway, me and my brother were out a little ways in the lake, just chilling, and my uncle throws the water football right at us. It skips off the surface and is about to hit my brother right in the back of the head. He was facing away from the shore when I just reach out and catch it right as it's about to hit him. The second time was at the end of the vacation when we were saying goodbye to that same uncle outside of the restaurant he worked at. My brother was wearing sweatpants with kind of shallow pockets, and his phone was about half out of his pocket and was about to fall out. So his phone falls out of his pocket, and I just bend down and catch it before it hits the ground, and then just stand up and hand it to him. Story 5 I remember something similar to the paintball story happening to me during a friendly airsoft match. I had one of my nephews with me who had wanted to join, and everyone understood to go easy on him as he was new and didn't know what he was doing. Well, this one guy who is a bit annoying but is otherwise a good guy kept picking on him. He went out of his way to get my nephew out and just all around made the game very unenjoyable for him. Finally, I decided to confront him, and I told him to leave my nephew the hell alone. Well, he didn't like that, so he just decided to point his airsoft pistol right at me. Well, I didn't appreciate that, so I went to swat it aside, but when my hand hit his gun, my finger caught the trigger guard, and somehow the gun turned around, and when I felt the handle, I instinctively gripped it and brought it to bear on its owner. On the outside... I didn't let anything show, but internally I was freaking out trying to figure out what I did and how I did it. Needless to say, my friend finally got my point, and I handed him his pistol back and we were able to salvage the rest of the day, and my nephew ended up having a good bit of fun. Story 6. This year in high school I was 14, and I was entering the building when all of a sudden a fight took place on the other side of the street. Some teachers on the entrance went to stop them, but we didn't know anything about the fight after that since we cared more for class. After school was over, everyone got out of the building and they were looking at a big group of students, the class of the two students that started the fight earlier, that were chatting on the other side of the street. Everyone was scared of them because they didn't want to get beaten up by them. Now the problem was that they were blocking the way to my home. So instead of crossing the street again, going that way from the other side, I decided that I was too lazy for that and just decided to walk through them. I got in and out and kept my way. The next day at school, I realized that the guys blocking the side were actually the class that I mentioned before. I didn't know that. And to my surprise, everyone saw what I did, so they told me I was crazy or began asking me how did I do that. It was a fun experience, as I could have been stabbed really fast that day. That was a fun little story until we got to that last sentence. I didn't realize that the situation would have been that dangerous for him. In my school, people got in fights, but no one got stabbed. I guess in that regard, I consider myself very lucky. Story 7. This was during my senior year. We were playing pinball in gym. 
dodgeball but with three bowling pins on both teams. I was one of the last people on my team. I had a habit of being an ambush thrower. I'd wait for someone to throw a ball at someone else until I ran up and hit them. But of course, that wasn't much of an option. Being absolutely sure I was going to lose, I continued on, with the other team being stocked up with throwing balls. It was at this moment I somehow, out of some miracle, unlocked Ultra Instinct. I dodged balls left and right like it was absolutely nothing, deflected some of them with a the ball in my hands, and fired a barrage of the balls they threw at me. Heck of a comeback as most of my team was brought back in. I was a freaking ninja at that moment. Then I got hit dead center in the bridge of my nose. I wore glasses, so it slammed those into my face, too. I was fine, but that ended my streak. But despite that, I relished my classmates' impressed reactions to my short, brief, but also sweet glory as I ever so smoothly dodged an entire team of ball throwers while the moment lasted. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.